Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, welcome to Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, and thank you for coming out on such a, a nasty evening. Um, don't pay any attention to our clock here. It's um, that is not the correct time. It is actually seven o'clock. Um, so, a uh, welcome to our, our public talk tonight in the Sawanaga Science Series. Um, this is an annual series of, that um, the Institute has been doing for five years now. It's part of the Institute's brief for public outreach. The idea is to um, here in the Institute, we do uh, fundamental research at various levels, and um, we like to, to try and outreach the public and tell us what's, what's going on and what we're doing. Um, so there's a number of schools in, in the Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, we have um, Celtic Studies, Theoretical Physics, and Cosmic Physics. Uh, cosmic Physics includes Astrophysics, um, Astronomy, and, and Geology. But this evening's talk is from the School of Theoretical Physics. It'll be given by Dr. Venus Chaos. Um, Venus is a, a postdoctoral researcher in our School of Theoretical Physics here. Um, one of the areas of research that we're interested in is trying to understand nature and the laws of physics and the, the structure of matter at the most fundamental level. So there's a number of people in the school here who work on, on theoretical particle physics. And um, tonight, Venus is going to talk to us um, about an aspect of, of particle physics. Uh, but the Sawanaga Science Series goes on till um, the 7th of November. Tomorrow night's event is uh, fully booked out, I'm afraid. But um, next Monday, there's a Zoom talk, um, which is, and there, there are certainly places still available, where uh, Professor Mark Williams of the University of Leicester is going to ask, are we living in the Anthropocene? Um, the Anthropocene is uh, a name for the, the, the latest geological era when the human race is affecting our planet and our climate. So that'd be a, um, an interesting talk uh, not to be missed. And we also have um, the School of Theoretical Physics is doing an annual statutory lecture. This is not part of Samanaga's science, but every year uh, we, we put on a, a public lecture, a statutory public lecture. And uh, this year on the 14th of November, it's going to be given by Professor Nam, who's uh, going to tell us um, about a tale of two volcanoes. Um, as I understand it, the talk is going to be about archaeological evidence for two volcanic eruptions um, that occurred around 1500 BC, one in Europe and one in Alaska. Uh, so that'll be another interesting talk. That's in Trinity College. Um, so information about these things can be found on the, on the DIAS website. More information about uh, Sawanaga science can be found on uh, this, this link here. If you want to have a look at um, other things that are going on over the, over the next week. Um, so before I hand you over to, uh, to Venus, um, a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Um, the fire exit is exactly the same as the way you came in. If the alarm goes off, please uh, don't panic. Jump out of the window. <laughs> uh, just down the stairs and out of the door that you, that you came in. Uh, for to there's toilets, there's uh, both male and female toilets on the ground floor. They're just um, slightly past the lift in the stairwell when you, on the left-hand side where you came in. Um, and there's a, um, a non-binary toilet on the, on the fourth level. Okay, I think that's all I have to say. So I'll now hand you over to, uh, to Venus, who's, as I said, she's a postdoctoral researcher in the School of Theoretical Physics here. She came to us um, from a previous postdoctoral position in Helsinki. She was in Helsinki for a number of years, I believe. So Venus is going to exhort us uh, not to be afraid of the dark matter. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much for uh, yeah, coming here on such a horrible evening. I mean, uh, I, I live on the third floor and I could hear the wind. I was uh, really worried that nobody's going to make it here. I have a bunch of uh, nice logos of people who fund my research. Um, but yeah, today I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about dark matter, uh, but I have to warn you, we don't actually know that much about it, so I'm going to mostly talk about what we don't know about dark matter. Um, and to kind of put things in context, uh, I will tell you about the stuff that makes up the universe and kind of tell you the story of how we got here, at what point do we think stuff were produced, and why do we think dark matter is there, and why is it important? and how we look for it. Um, so yeah, let's just see where we are in the big picture and what is the universe made of. Um, I would like to take you back to your high school days if you have, uh, I'm, I'm fine, thank you very much. 
for those of you who have been through high school, you might remember your periodic table. And um, I'm guessing you, the rest of you who haven't even been to high school have heard of atoms. So according to the periodic table that we had in chemistry, um, we know that all the elements in the universe are made of uh, atoms. But uh, that is kind of the chemistry view of things. Uh, in particle physics, we, uh, we've managed to broken, break down these atoms and we know they are made of electrons and protons and neutrons. And the protons and neutrons are actually made of uh, elementary particles, uh, which are called quarks. So this is kind of the big picture of the standard model of particle physics. This is uh, what I work on with my PhD student who's over there. Um, and uh, as far as we know, as of today, these are the elementary building blocks of, uh, of nature. Um, who knows? Um, in a hundred years, we might be able to break them into smaller pieces. But um, these look like to be the um, subatomic particles, the building blocks, the fundamental particles um, of nature. And basically everything that you see in the periodic table is just made of the uh, bunch of particles that you see are circled. That is the first family of the family, the three families that we have of fermions in the standard model. Um, I don't wanna tell you about all the particles we have with the very genius names that we've come up with. I don't know, physicists are not really good with, uh, with names, I mean, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. But basically, um, we're gonna come back to um, the photon, which is a particle of light. Um, and the um, protons and neutrons. So uh, just maybe try to remember those names. Um, so you might think out of all the particles that we have um, and all the whatever um, elements that we have, uh, this is it, this is what builds up most of the universe, but that is actually not a very accurate picture. Uh, all of these, uh, these particles and elements together, they build up about 5% of the matter content of the universe. About 25% of the content of the universe is what we call dark matter, is matter that we don't see. Um, and there's a big chunk of the energy content of the universe, which is dark energy, which I'm not gonna talk about because we know even less about it. But dark matter is basically, um, it is matter, but it is matter that we don't see. Um, hence the name, dark. Um, we know it exists through its uh, gravitational um, interactions with us. So it talks to us through gravity. It feels gravity very much like a pen that you drop and goes to the earth because it feels the gravity of, of the earth, but we don't see it. So actually when you look at a, let's say um, a galaxy, you it might look like there's not much happening. There is just a uh, some luminous matter, some visible matter in the close to the center of the galaxy. But if you could also see the uh, dark matter content of the, the galaxy, you would see that there is a huge amount of it just spread out. So um, to tell you what we know or what we don't know about dark matter and how it came to be, I have to take you through um, the history of the universe or the evolution of the universe. Um, so how did we get here? Um, one of the best theories that we have of how the universe started is the Big Bang Theory, which I'm guessing you've heard of, which basically predicts that everything started from a teeny tiny speck, and it's just during a period of um, exponential expansion, the universe just grew. So there is a region uh, or a teeny tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang, um, there is a, a period where the universe expands um, exponentially. We call that, um, that period inflation, uh, which has nothing to do with what is happening to the uh, financial market. But um, so we don't know exactly what happened before. We don't know exactly what happened at the time of the Big Bang. And it's only one of the theories where we got, but we know a teeny tiny fraction of a second after that the universe started expanding. So um, there's a bunch of complicated stuff that has happened in the first um, second, but I'm gonna 
jump over those and get you to the next kind of interesting moment. So this is, we're still at the very beginning of the universe, right? Um, after about a second, um, after the birth of the universe, um, where did the stick go? I did say that I don't need it, but, uh, oh, it's right here. Fantastic, yeah. So um, after about a second, um, after the birth of the universe, was the first time when um, the uh, nuclei could, uh, well, not the nuclei yet, but um, quarks, the particles that I showed you in the uh, big, beautiful picture of the standard model, um, came together and formed the uh, protons and neutrons. Um, so you see inside the protons and neutrons, as I showed you before, there are like three quarks that are sitting together. Um, and um, so it's about a second after the birth of the universe, the uh, temperature is incredibly high, the energy is really, really high. And that is actually what we try to reproduce in um, our collider experiments. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, this is like a, a view from the top of the Large Hadron Collider, which is underground in this um, big circular um, pattern, and it goes between two different countries. Um, and uh, what we do, or what uh, experimentalists do, I'm a theoretical physicist, I just sit in front of my computer and think about stuff. But basically what they do is that they try to um, uh, get protons go really, really, really fast, and then they collide them with each other. And uh, through the energy that is produced um, and the conditions that are produced in there, they're basically recreating what happened one second after the birth of the universe. To, um, to study it and see if we can figure anything about uh, figure anything out about what we're here. Um, so for the next three minutes, let's say um, for the purpose of this talk, nothing interesting happened. But it was only after three minutes that the uh, atomic nuclei were formed. So the protons and neutrons were there. Now they've come together to build the nuclei. Um, and then again, for the purpose of this talk, and as far as I'm concerned, nothing interesting happened for another 380,000 years. Um, so the atomic nuclei are formed, they're going around, uh, there are electrons also going around, there are photons, the particles of light. But there's this big hot mess, everything is kind of bumping into each other, nobody can really travel that far, right? But after about 380,000 years, the universe cooled down enough for the electrons to kind of uh, be captured around the nuclei. So for example, here, if uh, we had, let's say, if that's a nucleus and this is an electron and these are charged particles, right? There's a big soup of stuff going around and the particle of light, the photon, wants to travel, but it keeps on uh, bumping uh, to these particles and it interacts with them, right? So, if anything was around them, let's say uh, we were there, we, we couldn't really see anything because you see stuff through the photons that they send to you. Um, so this is after 380,000 years, for the first time electrons are captured, and they start going around the nucleus. And as a whole, it looks like a neutral uh, entity. So the photon doesn't interact with it anymore. And it is for the first time that it can travel um, without any interruptions. So basically from here. So before this, there's nothing that we could see. By see, I mean uh, detecting any photons. From this moment onwards is when the photons started um, traveling. And um, you might have seen this beautiful image. It's called the cosmic microwave background, which is the very first snapshot of exactly this moment in the age of the universe the first time that photons started traveling and we could see. Um, yeah, so we're gonna come back to that cosmic microwave background, which is basically these beautiful uh, colors. Um, these are the temperature differences in different uh, kind of parts of the sky. This is basically a whole map of the sky. So what happened next? Again, as far as I'm concerned, this is all the interesting stuff. Um, after this, it's all um, astrophysics and astronomy. Um, which is, yeah, I guess exciting, but uh, yeah, that's not what I work on. So um, from 380,000 years onwards, it took a very, very long time for 
um, stars to appear, about 30 million years or so. Um, we needed another 200, well, not another, but 200 million years after the birth of uh, the universe, um, our galaxy, the Milky Way, uh, was formed. And as you know, we're uh, at the very edge of the, uh, the Milky Way galaxy. That's where our solar system is. But our solar system was only formed 9 billion years after the uh, birth of the universe. And there's me. Um, and it took another a uh, couple of billion years for life to begin on Earth. And uh, as you may have heard, about 13.8 billion years after the birth of the universe for us to uh, show up here at Dias. And this picture was not taken today. Today it did not look like this. So um, now that we kind of know um, how we've gotten here, uh, I want to tell you more about uh, dark matter and why we think it is there, because as you see, um, all the, well, basically everything in the universe, uh, visible matter and dark matter was all produced during this time, right? Now, um, you might say, uh, fine, things were produced, but uh, we look outside, we see um, galaxies, we see stars. How do we know there is dark matter? And it all started with a cluster that was moving a bit too fast. So a cluster is a bunch of galaxies that are kind of close to each other, and they seem to move together. And uh, it was in 1930s where this guy, Fritz Zwicky, um, he was basically looking out into the sky. And it seems all of our discoveries come from us looking at the sky. And um, he noticed this um, galaxy cluster. So these are a bunch of galaxies kind of close-ish to each other on large scales. And um, they're all moving around together, right? But when he looks at the sky, uh, judging by the um, mass or the gravitational pull of the visible matter that he sees, the galaxy is moving a bit too fast. So um, you would expect, um, let's say if you have a bag of, um, onions, let's say, and you start rotating this, if the bag is not very strong, the onions will start flying apart, right? Um, that was the case with this galaxy, it was moving really fast, um, and you would expect the, uh, so in the cluster, you would expect the galaxies to start uh, flying apart, but they, but they weren't. So it seemed like there was some gravitational force that was pulling them all together, holding them together, um, but it wasn't due to the um, visible stuff that we, he was looking at. Um, so he came up with the idea of dark matter, uh, which was basically holding this galaxy cluster together. Um, about 40 years later or so, um, people were looking at now specific galaxies, not a cluster anymore. Um, so here's a spiral kind of galaxy. This is the center of the galaxy where you see a lot of stuff happening. So it's very luminous. It's very bright. Um, there's a lot of uh, stars and uh, planets and whatever gathered together. And as you move away from the center of the galaxy, it looks less and less busy, right? So you would expect, again, as you move away from the center of the galaxy, the speed and the rotational speed of the stuff that are rotating with the galaxy would kind of go down, right? So um, that would be the center of the galaxy. This is how far away you are from the center of the galaxy. And you would expect, this is the, the thing that people expected to see as they started measuring the velocities, the rotational speed of these stars going out from the center of the galaxy. And um, it looked like that wasn't the case. Um, as they went out, towards the edges of the galaxy, the rotational speed stayed the same. So as if it was uh, kind of like a solid disk that um, as you went out, the speed didn't, didn't go down. So they realized um, there must be something again that would hold this structure together um, and dark matter would, uh, would fit in there very well. Um, so here's the picture of the cosmic microwave background. 
which uh, shows up here again. And um, this is another very good evidence that we have for the existence of dark matter. Let me tell you a little bit what this, uh, this structure is here. So the blue regions are the regions that are a little bit cold. And that means there's not much happening there. Okay, they're kind of these um, regions of, um, of the sky that are empty. The um, red regions are where a lot of stuff is happening. So these are kind of dense regions where there's a lot of gravitational pull. So as we've learned so far, dark matter doesn't interact with visible matter, right? It doesn't interact with photons. It doesn't send us any, um, any photons to see it. So if you sent a photon, it would just go through it. Um, so when you look at the, the cosmic microwave background, the patterns of it, you would expect the, um, in the empty regions, the void regions for uh, the known particles, such as the photon to be kind of pushing things out, right? And the dense regions would be pulling stuff in because uh, they have gravity, right? Um, for dark matter, it wouldn't, if it existed in these regions, it wouldn't feel the outward push of the photons because it doesn't interact with the photons, but it would certainly feel the gravitational pull in the dense regions, right? So the amount of dark matter there is in the universe or was there um, 380,000 years after the birth of the universe would definitely affect the shape of this uh, cosmic microwave background. Um, and there's a very uh, cool um, experiment here, or well, a simulation that these people have put together. Uh, Planck is the name of a, a satellite that we've got. And they yeah. actually, um, I highly recommend that you play with this thing. They have um, this beautiful simulation where you get to choose uh, how much dark matter or dark energy or ordinary matter you want to put in your simulated universe. And they tell you, try to reduce the size of this, did I, or am I making it bigger and bigger? I hope a little bit bigger, better. So you will be able to produce the cosmic microwave background of your simulated universe, right? Um, so you can actually, and this, this bit is the bit that is actually what we see. This is our universe, the one we live in. And you can try to reproduce patterns similar to this by adjusting the amount of uh, matter, normal matter, dark matter in your universe. And you see that it's not possible to do, to do that without dark matter. Let me put dark matter to zero. Oh, actually it doesn't even produce a universe. It just says, uh, yeah, it's not possible to produce a universe without dark matter. So let's say we have very little dark matter and a lot more matter. And you see what you produce does not look anything like the thing that we see. So um, somehow I should be able to get out of this. There. Yeah, okay. So on top of the stuff that we had already seen, the fact that the galaxies and galaxy clusters move in a way that was only explainable uh, with dark matter, also, when we looked at the very precise measurements of the cosmic microwave background, and this might look like a, a messy picture to you, but the uh, dark blue regions and the dark red regions, the, uh, the temperature difference there is really, really small. So um, it's, uh, it's a very good um, kind of image with a very good definition, high, what do you call it, high definition um, of, of the very um, early ages of the universe. Um, but uh, obviously, as scientists, um, you, you're not just convinced. Uh, you go, well, you, you, I know it exists, but uh, let's be 100% sure. So people started looking at basically galaxies colliding with each other. And there are two ways of looking at an event like that. So a galaxy would be, um, the center of the galaxy would be very massive. Um, sometimes you might have a black hole in the center of the galaxy. And as you saw, you go away from the center of the galaxy, the luminous matter, there's less and less of it, right? Um, and uh, people started looking at two galaxies kind of colliding with each other. Um, and they can look at this um, through um, 
gravitational observations that we have, um, meaning that the light that is coming from the stars around this phenomena, this galaxy collision, um, does bend because there is a lot of gravitational pull and it does affect photons as well. Um, and also they can see basically there's a, well, optical ob observations, meaning that if you look at the collision of the galaxies and you see it's, a, it's an energetic event. Um, so um, they did a simulation of, uh, of these galaxies colliding. And basically in a movie that I'm gonna show you here, the, uh, the visible matter, the ordinary stuff that we see is shown by red and dark matter is the blue stuff. So what you see is that as the galaxies collide, the visible matter, the red stuff, will um, well, they interact with each other, right? So very much like if you hit two balls together, um, they would basically collide. Um, but dark matter, because it doesn't feel any of the visible matter um, interactions, it just slides through, whereas um, the, uh, the visible matter stays in. So you see the two galaxies collided. The red stuff is the ordinary matter, which stays in the middle because they are, uh, well, they're going through each other, they're interacting with each other. Whereas the blue stuff, which is dark matter, kind of just slides through, right? So um, this was a, a very good kind of um, extra uh, justification for the fact that dark matter does exist. Um, because well, without dark matter, you wouldn't be able to um, explain um, such a um, galaxy merger, it's called, when the two galaxies kind of collide with each other and form a new galaxy. Okay, so um, hopefully I have convinced you so far that there is dark matter. We don't really know what it is, but we know it's there. Um, but let's see how we, um, how we look for it. So again, it's uh, something we don't know. Uh, we, well, we know where it is, we just don't know what it is. And we have to be really clever um, when we're looking for it. Um, one of the, the ways of looking for it is through what we call direct detection experiments. So these are um, deep underground experiments and they are gigantic tanks of uh, liquid gas, noble gas, for example, xenon. Um, again, from your periodic table, you might remember xenon. Um, it's, a, um, it's a noble gas, so it doesn't interact with uh, other things very much. And you go very deep underground because you don't want anything else to come and mess with your experiment, right? And uh, what you're hoping to see is that in this very calm environment, um, dark matter particles that will go through the earth because why wouldn't they, right? Um, we are in the Milky Way galaxy. The galaxy is moving, dark matter is supposed to be around. So dark matter particles would go through the earth as well because they don't interact with the ordinary matter. So if they had to go through you, um, yeah, they don't, they don't have to do, they don't have to cut a hole in your body, they can just go through you, right? Um, so we expect to see the same thing deep underground. And basically what we have there is that, is this um, xenon um, atom, which as I said, is very heavy uh, with electrons going around it. Um, so dark matter would go through this experiment and you would expect, expect it to, as it is going through, uh, would bump against um, one of your um, nuclei and um, the energy that it produces uh, would come out as, um, as uh, scintillation light, as light. So basically in this gigantic tank, um, you have about almost a ton of this uh, liquid gas and you just sit there and wait quietly for a dark matter particle to come and hopefully uh, bump against one of your nuclei. And from the um, recoil energy that it produces, you would get some um, light. And on the bottom and the top of this gigantic tank, you have what is called a photon uh, multiplier. So they're just really sensitive to, um, to observing light. Um, and there's a really smart thing that they do here is that they put an electric field um, uh, across this, uh, this tank. Um, so when dark matter hits 
uh, a particle, it produces a bit of light, but also some energetic um, kind of bounces off some electrons off of the atom. And um, the electrons will start moving in this electric field and they'll uh, catch them again um, as they go up. I have a video here. Let me see if we can um, look at this. So that's a dark matter particle coming in. Um, the video is going to keep on playing over. So they, they detect two signals, right? Hopefully, if, um, if we're lucky. Um, so the dark matter particle comes, bumps against the gas, releases some uh, photons, which you saw the uh, uh, top and bottom um, detectors kind of light up. And that is the signal that they call S1. And, and as it produces some bumps, some electrons off of the, um, off of the atom, they start moving in this electric field. And when they get to the top, again, um, this is a charged particle um, and they will see that again. Um, so this is what we've got. Uh, it is a very good experiment, it's very precise. We use it for observing neutrinos, for example, which is another particle that keeps on moving around. Um, but we haven't seen anything yet, right? So, um, so far, we can only um, put a, a kind of what we call an upper bound on the strength of this interaction, right? Because uh, we know uh, dark matter interacts mostly through gravity. Well, so far, we haven't seen anything because this is, this is not a gravitational um, experiment, right? As it bumps against the, um, the atom, you would expect it to interact with it. Um, but um, yeah, so far, haven't seen anything. So uh, we can't say really we've seen dark matter, but again, we know it exists. We're convinced that it exists, we just haven't, uh, well, haven't detected it yet, which is why nobody has got a Nobel Prize for uh, dark matter, by the way. Um, yeah, so um, let's, let's move on to indirect detection, uh, which is another way of looking for dark matter. Um, so we've talked about dark matter really liking gravity, right? It feels gravity. So it would naturally like to be in dense regions. For example, the center of our galaxy, which is a very busy region. Um, also the center of uh, our sun, right? So you'd expect a lot of dark matter particles to be around. And um, you just hope that two of these dark matter particles would come together and produce a, uh, a visible particle that we know. So for example, um, a photon, we show it with these wiggly lines um, or neutrinos. Um, and we do that by, um, for example, this is one of the telescopes we've got Fermi Lat that is in the Earth's orbit and it basically looks at well maps the whole sky and looks for energetic photons or neutrinos coming from dense regions and obviously there are a lot of visible stuff um, out there um, in space but we know um, a lot of these astrophysical sources right um, we've studied them we know if there is a photon coming from that direction it is probably or uh, most probably from this particular source. But if there are energetic particles uh, in, uh, in particular photons coming from the center of a galaxy for which we have no explanation, then we could tell it's probably dark matter. Again, haven't seen anything yet. It looks like there is a bit of an um, excess of energetic photons coming from the center of the, um, the Milky Way galaxy, but we don't know if it is from dark matter or not. And uh, to be able to claim a discovery, you have to uh, really convince yourself. And yeah, scientists, they're, they're really picky. Uh, you can't just say, I found it and here's, here's dark matter. The other scientists will jump on you and uh, yeah, won't be quiet until you know 100% sure it is dark matter. Um, we have another way of uh, looking for dark matter. We kind of hope to uh, be able to produce it. Um, and again, um, as we've talked about, dark matter mostly interacts through gravity. That's uh, the observational evidence that we have for it. But when we look for it, we're hoping to be able to produce it through other interactions it might have. 
So remember we talked about the um, uh, Large Hadron Collider and um, we talked about the fact that they um, make protons go really, really fast and then collide them with each other. And with the high energies that is produced um, in those collisions, we hope to be able to produce dark matter. Um, and obviously it's dark matter, we don't see it through any normal interactions. So basically, um, so this, this is the, the, the pipe that goes through the experiment um, where the protons are sent. And this is basically a, if I cut this and look through, um, through the pipe, you would see, this is a cartoon of what you would kind of see, right? So the particles are coming like this, they're colliding with each other and whatever comes out of this collision goes out and they are detectors sitting everywhere. So these would be the detectors sitting around and they basically ready to see what comes out of this collision. And there's a big mess of junk that comes out, but, but we know a lot of that junk, right? Um, we know there are proton jets, there are photon jets, um, whatever particle, especially if it's um, electrically charged, we know it. But there are um, instances where um, you, see, you see a particle coming out and kind of going one direction and you'd expect um, another particle going the opposite direction, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, energy should be conserved. You can't just bump two billiard balls against each other and you just see both of them going that way and nothing goes this way. That just, it doesn't make sense, right? So we can kind of tell that, oh, uh, we can see visible particles going along certain directions, but there is some nothingness that must have gone uh, in other directions. Um, and that's what we call missing transfer energy. And um, that could be uh, dark matter. So um, again, so far, we haven't seen anything, but there is a possibility that we could produce it. Um, now, the thing with these um, experiments is that it, is, it very much depends on what your dark matter is, right? Through its gravitational observation, we just know that it's there. Through um, kind of detection experiments, we hope to learn about what it is. Um, so um, what do people do? People like me, um, we sit in our offices and just draw lots of, uh, it probably looks Greek to you, but yeah, we write lots of equations, we draw diagrams, we show these particles with just different, we've got a wiggly line for this one, we've got a straight line for another one. And we basically try to come up with models that have dark matter candidates. So what I do, for example, is that if you remember this picture of the standard model, um, there was only one Higgs particle there. This was the particle that was discovered in 2012 at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and um, yeah, so, so far with the particles of the standard model that we have observed, uh, none of them are candidates for dark matter. Um, what I work on is models where uh, there is extra particles which have not been seen, uh, but they could be dark matter candidates. So basically um, knowing the interactions of these particles with the rest of them, um, I draw a lot of those diagrams and then I come up with um, ways of seeing dark matter, right? Then to get a Nobel Prize, I have to um, then tell different experiments, this is exactly what I expect you to see and where. So if you are producing it at an experiment, this is where I expect you to see it. This is um, what its energy is gonna be. This is what its mass is gonna be. Or if you're looking at the center of the galaxy, I would expect to see this. Or in an underground experiment, this is um, where I expect you to find it. And if they do, then we all get a Nobel Prize together. Um, and with that, I just wanna thank you. Um, this is a joke that uh, to me as a physicist, it is really funny, but uh, I understand if uh, members of the public don't find it funny, um, but uh, that's it. And uh, the room is open for questions.
we have time for questions. If anyone wants to ask you this, yes, I'm just trying to simulate exactly what you said there. So I'm trying to paraphrase you now, or at least try and go back into it. But I need to clarify a few things before I do that. So you're saying at one second mm -hmm. of the universe um, to three minutes, well, one second to three minutes, it expands out. And I'm trying to figure out, well, it's trying to figure out if it goes to 13.7 billion at the first moment, or if it just goes to 10 billion or 5 billion to get the size. And then you say around 200 million years, the Milky Way, proto Milky Way is formed. Now I take the proto Milky Way is either 10,000 light years across with a diameter disk, or maybe 20,000 light years across. And dark matter in it would be 100,000 light years across. And we know today at 13.7 billion, which again the universe is expanded into since the moment of the first second, so it's expanded second ratio, Asia, you have a Milky Way galaxy of 100,000 light years across, maybe 200,000 light years across, with dark matter 1 million light years across. And in between those two, we know, just like you have the coma cluster of galaxies, or as we have the Andromeda cluster of galaxies, they've all smashed into each other crashed into each other, hammered each other, and you might have had 20 galactic collisions between them, obviously taking ma uh, ordinary matter and dark matter from each one as we come along, and hence it moves from 10,000 light years to 100,000 light years, and the dark matter moves from 100,000 light years to 1 million light years across. Now, that's my understanding of it as I see it. But so it's like as if two cars crashed into each other or two galaxies move and cross each other and maybe go side by side. And all you're left with is, how do you know that happened? And all you're left with is the exhaust fumes coming out of it. That's the only reason you know that that happened there is exhaust fumes. Now, is that, does that trace happen in this galaxy that we have a trail of exhaust fumes or is the dark matter there since the first second and has moved right across to 10, to 13.7 to now. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if I understood all of uh, your working, but um, the idea is that yes, dark matter was produced um, at very early stages in the universe. Um, and um, when it comes to uh, the crash of two, two galaxy uh, clusters together, like we had here. Um, so as I said, it's, so it's not just the exhaust fumes or what, what you uh, uh, refer to as exhaust fumes. Um, it is, uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, we have different ways of looking at uh, such a collision. And there are lots of collisions that have happened. This is one that we were uh, particularly looking at um, and we were, we, had, we were looking at it with different uh, tools, right? So um, one of the tools that we have is um, basically ordinary, um, let's say optical tools, meaning that if there is a collision, there's a lot of light coming out and we see a big burst, Dimension right? Car. Like Something like that, yeah. Um, the other thing that we have is um, looking at the event through um, gravitational observations. So the way um, these observations work is that they look at basically, um, uh, let me draw a picture for you. So um, here's us, we are looking at basically an event uh, over here, let's say, so two galaxies, colliding right if there is a star in the in the behind these two galaxies colliding before let's say these are the two galaxies and they're supposed to be spiral galaxies uh, coming towards each other right it's the gravitational pull that's bringing them together so before the collision happens 
we, we know the position of different stars, right? Because it is sending us a light. But as these two galaxies come together and collide, so now there's a big miss happening over here. And um, the, so there's this huge amount of gravity here, right? right? So the light that this uh, star is also sending out will be bent, let me erase these two. It will be bent because it responds to gravity, right? And these lights, these uh, rays will come to us as well. But what we see is we see a light coming from here and we, we would expect light to move in a straight line, right? So the star that you were looking at before, which looked like one shiny spot, now you also have um, what looks like light that is coming from different places. So the star suddenly looks like a, um, a ring of... Uh, well, the two galaxies collided. The transfer, the transfer of energy, the dark matter between the two, yeah. obviously they come in at one mass size and when they collide, they transfer dark energy and ordinary matter or starlight to, uh, to each other. And when they move apart, there'll be different sizes to go where they went in. Uh, what, so what, the, the dark energy has got to be in there somewhere. Uh, dark matter, you mean? Oh, dark matter, sorry, yeah. It, it is in there, it is in there. I'm not saying it's, it's flown apart. So what I was showing in there is that um, you see the visible matter, it interacts with the rest of the visible matter very much, right? So uh, they don't just go through each other, right? They collide with each other and you see a lot of mess happening in the center. That's what the red stuff is. Yeah. Uh, but each of the galaxies, you see before they started, there's a mixture of blue and red. So there's dark matter in the galaxy. And as they collide with each other... Yeah, they uh, seem to remain the same size in that picture. No, I would have thought they would have changed in size. The smaller one might have got a bit bigger, and the bigger one might have got a bit smaller. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. So, so the story that I'm trying to show here is that um, dark matter goes through the visible matter, but of course, th this is just uh, before the system has come to a um, an equilibrium. Of course, right now, what you're seeing is dark matter, two dark matter patches outside but there's obviously gravitational pull of the visible matter that we pull it back together. So these galaxies aren't just going uh, through each other and goodbye. It, this is a galaxy merger. So they actually come together and become one big galaxy, right? right. Well, they yes. Double, double the size. Yes. And the dark matter doubles in size automatically as well? Uh, so, Dark so the dark matter that you see in that galaxy uh, merged now, it's double the size of, or it's a sum of what was in this one and what was in the other one. Yes. But, yeah. Any, any more questions? Anyone else want to continue? Okay, my question is simple. So uh, and, uh, we are talking about dark matters. I want to know that how, how many dark matter are around us, for example, how many dark matter are within Earth or science, gravity, gravitational veil or something like uh, is orbiting science, something like that, or it just we don't know about that. Yeah, so, so we don't know, uh, what we know is um, what is the density of it, um, but we don't know how many particles they are because it depends on how massive each dark matter particle is, right? If it was really massive, then it'd be a smaller number of it. But if it was very light, there'd be a lot of them. Um, and again, we don't know. Just from the observations that we've had, uh, specifically from this one, we know how much dark matter there is. Um, and this is basically, so this is 380,000 years after the birth of universe. So whatever dark matter was going to be produced was produced. And this is what it's end, ended up with. Um, they call that the relic density, meaning leftover density. We just know how much of it there is, but we have no idea of the number density, how many particles there are. So we don't know what the percentage of, so we don't know what the percentage of uh, solar system is composed. For example, there is, we don't know, for example, there are 20% of dark matter in solar system. We don't, we don't know this percentage. We so, just know we, it probably exists because some of the uh, background radiation custom background radiation, but we don't know how many of the, how many percentage of for example, solar system is composed of visible matter and dark matter. For, for each galaxy, we have no idea. I mean, 
um, well, there are galaxies, and if there's a specific galaxy, something would have to happen. Like, for example, with the galaxy merger, you kind of get an idea of um, how much dark matter, well, let's say, uh, this galaxy had compared to the other one, right? Um, but, um, but there are galaxies that don't have dark matter. They've actually uh, seen some galaxies, very few, but galaxies that are without any dark matter. Um, but yeah, uh, per specific galaxy, we don't really know. We just know in total, uh, there is 5% matter, 25% dark matter, and the rest of it is dark energy. So just in general, we know there's 5% or five times more matter. Um, dark matter is five times more than there is matter, but we don't know for each specific galaxy. Oh, thanks. Sure. Any more questions? Is dark matter necessarily conserved the same way that matter is or energy is? Is that a quantity that we know it stays constant or does it is it changing? Um, so it's a very, very good question, very difficult question. So you see, um, when I was talking about looking for dark matter particles, um, I talk about two dark matter particles kind of hitting each other and producing something else. We call it an annihilation because the two dark matter particles have annihilated into something else. Um, so the thing is that in the very early universe, uh, whatever had happened had produced a certain amount of dark matter, right? That is the amount that we've seen. But in dense regions, like the center of the galaxy, there are dark matter particles. They might bang uh, against each other and annihilate into nothing. But um, the, the environment is hot enough or energetic enough for the reverse process to happen as well, right? For uh, visible particles to bang against each other and produce dark matter. So the thing is that um, it is kind of an uh, evolving situation, but at the end of the day, um, so this is something that happens in uh, the center of a galaxy in dense regions, but overall, uh, the universe is quite vast um, and it is very um, unlikely uh, for two dark matter particles to come together to annihilate into nothing. Where it does happen, the reverse process happens as well. But, but in, in general, uh, in the universe as a whole, the amount of dark matter we have is basically what it is. Um, thank you. In the standard model diagram that you threw up, mm -hmm. There were no antimatter particles shown in it. That's right. Yeah. Is there any such thing as an anti dark matter particle? And could you infer the existence of a dark matter particle where an anti dark matter particle found? These, these are brilliant questions. Yeah. So, so I haven't showed you the anti uh, anti particles of the particles here. Each of the particles you see do have an anti particle. So the the one that I guess is most familiar is the electron, which has got a um, it's negatively charged, right? Um, it's antiparticle, it's called a positron. Uh, it's got exactly the same properties, same mass, everything. Um, it's electric charge is the opposite though. Um, so with dark matter, we know very little, right? Um, we just know where it is. We know how much of it there is. Um, but certainly, um, again, theoretical physicists, we, we think of whatever. Um, We've got all the time we need. And um, a lot of the models that people come up with have um, dark matter particles whose antiparticle is a different particle, right? Um, but generally, uh, for a particle that is electrically neutral, like the photon, um, so the idea of uh, an antiparticle is that its properties are exactly the same as the particle itself, except its electric charge is reversed, right? So for the electron, it'd be a posit positron. For a neutral particle, it's very difficult to, um, to come up with an antiparticle um, that is different from the particle itself. So for example, the photon, which is the uh, particle of light, and it, it doesn't have an electric charge, it is its own antiparticle, right? 
uh, with dark matter, you would expect it to be electrically neutral because otherwise, uh, well, we could see it because charged particles interact with the photon. If a photon hits a particle that is charged, it will come back to you and you'll see it, right? So dark matter as a whole, it should be neutral, um, but we don't know what is the substructure of dark matter. Is it a particle that might be charged, but it has an, a structure that makes it look neutral, like very much like um, protons, uh, which are positively charged, right? But you look at the uh, hydrogen atom, it has a positively charged nucleus, but has a negatively charged electron going around it, right? So uh, if you look at it from far away, it looks like a neutral thing, right? Um, so we don't know. Some of the models of dark matter have milli charged particles in them. Um, but also it could be that there is other properties apart from the mass or the electric charge or whatever color um, that dark matter might have that it's antiparticle might not, or you know, have the opposite. So um, again, that's a possibility. Uh, it is an active field of research, but then yeah, you have to come up with whatever theory you come up with, you have to give experimentalists a way of seeing it. Thank you. Sure. Um, thanks. It's a very interesting question. I think it's okay. Um, uh, so it seems like dark matter is everywhere, mm -hmm. but I don't get why you make the assumption that um, the dark matter that we observe here is mm -hmm. made with the same particle of the dark matter that could be somewhere else in the universe. Oh, absolutely. Why, yeah. why you make this assumption? Yeah. Uh, that's just a simplifying assumption that we make. The thing is that, uh, I mean, look at the number of particles we have in the standard model, and that is only 5% of everything that is in the universe. Uh, the amount of dark matter we have is five times more. So it is a bit difficult to think that, oh, it is just the one particle of dark matter and it is everywhere. Um, but the thing is that we have to start from somewhere. And we've started with the simple assumption of, let's say it's just one particle, well, one type of particle. Um, there is, yeah, it's the same everywhere in the universe. Um, but yeah, I mean, already with that, we've come up with experiments. Again, at the end of the day, whatever you come up with, you have to come with an experiment that could see it. Um, and it, it's quite difficult, but uh, you're absolutely right. It, it is very, very sim simple way of thinking uh, about it to think that there's just one particle and it's the same particle everywhere. But because it was all produced in the early universe from the same source, you would kind of expect it not to be too wild. Uh, there are models of multi-component dark matter where you would think, well, yeah, it's got different versions. But it is also possible that 5% of dark matter is of one kind, 20% is of another kind. That is, uh, um, yeah might move with a different speed, it might have a different mass, that is um, absolutely a possibility. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One more question and then I'll have to be sorry. Oh, uh, for the direct detection experiments, you said that it's possible to pick up neutrinos as well as mm -hmm. dark matter. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that you can tell the difference between the two of them? Oh, these experiments this are so smart. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how they do it, but... Uh, Yes, um, definitely. So uh, let's have a look at the, yeah, this one. So uh, with a neutrino, um, especially if you know where it's coming from, like for example, from the center of the sun, you kind of know what energy um, it is bringing with it, with it. And with neutrinos, we know exactly what kind of part, well, I'm gonna say what kind of particle it is. The physicists in the room are gonna tell me, do we really? But we know, um, we know what kind of particle it is. We know um, how probable it is um, for it to interact with this stuff. And what is the um, strength of that, uh, of interaction, right? So if a neutrino hits um, a xenon particle in here, it would produce the same signal, exactly the same signal, uh, but the experimentalist will, will be able to tell, was this a neutrino or um, was, it, um, was it a dark? 
dark matter particle. But uh, yeah, the interaction, I'm really trying not to use uh, physics -y words, um, probability, strength of a neutrino is very, very small, but at least known. Whereas with dark matter, yeah, just it's just something that you can't explain with, with neutrinos or with anything else. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Oh. I, I'm, I'm not tired if people have questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, another one. Hi. Um, towards the beginning, you showed um, one of the models that you were working on that had two more scalar bosons in it. Mm -hmm. What would be the function of having two? For one, is that like the one model? Mm -hmm. uh, because you're talking about having like dark matter candidate particles. Mm -hmm. But what would be the function of having those two scalar bosons in the same model? It's a brilliant question. Um, so, so the thing is that um, what I didn't tell you about is the fact that the standard model, um, as beautiful as it is, and we've um, verified it uh, with experiments time and time again. People have put this together. It took them a good forty years to put the uh, not this picture, but you know the mathematical workings of it together. And uh, just out of the framework uh, comes out that, oh, um, there must be another particle there, like the muon. And uh, what nobody has seen it yet, so th this is like ages ago. Uh, I've forgotten when the muon was, uh, was discovered uh, in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, when, when was it? Was yeah. 40s. 40s, oh, wow. yeah. Um, so what, what is that famous story of uh, when the muon was discovered and they said, uh, um, Robbie said, who ordered that? Because they couldn't. Well, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I was the second yeah. generation. Once you understood it was the second generation. Uh -huh, so, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so from the mathematical framework that you've put together, um, you expect to see particles, and then there you go. In the experiment, they actually see the particle. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful theory. Fantastic. But there are uh, some shortcomings to it. First of all, you see there's no gravity there. And it's a force that we, we know is there. We, we owe our existence to it. But it has no has nothing to do with gravity, the standard model. Uh, you can't actually put these two together. We haven't come up with a theory that does that. Um, none of the particles are good dark matter candidates. There is also the period of inflation. Um, the standard model doesn't tell you how, who was responsible for inflation. None of the particles here are uh, good inflaton candidates. But whenever we come up with something that uh, we don't really know what it is, we give it a particle name. Inflation, inflaton. Uh, my word for internet is interneton. Um, I don't know how it works, but yeah, it, it has a particle. So um, um, it doesn't give an explanation for that. Another thing is that um, the antimatter issue um, that was brought up. Um, we look out and we only see matter. We don't see any antimatter, but we don't know why, because the equations tell us that whatever produced matter must have also produced antimatter, but where is it gone? Um, and the standard model doesn't give any explanation why that is. Um, so what people do is, people like me, we work on beyond standard model theories. The theory that I'm really um, fond of is, this thing with three Higgses. The motivation came uh, ages ago, about 50 years ago, from the fact that every other particle that we've seen um, has, well, three families, let's say, the fermions. Um, they all have, not all, but if there is a neutral one, there is also a charged one. So why not the Higgs boson? The Higgs boson is the particle that uh, was predicted for about, 40 years and nobody had seen it. And it was just discovered uh, about 10 years ago now, wow, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so we love the standard model, but we know it's not complete. And um, the three Higgs double model, the model that I work on is a very simple framework of giving explanation to a lot of the things that the standard model doesn't cover. Um, so one of those guys could be your dark matter candidate. The other one could be your inflaton candidate. And then, uh, with that framework, you can also explain why we don't see any antimatter. Um, so um, yeah, lots of good things uh, coming out of that specific framework.
but um, if you want to know more definitely let's talk yeah and even now i didn't tell you about the things that are wrong with the standard model all of them there's so many more. no just about three more yeah just a question um the two scalar bosons that you've introduced mm -hmm. Are those ones that you've mathematically like found in some equation, or do you just randomly assume that they're there and then work off that assumption? That's, that's exactly what I did. Okay. Yeah, I was just yeah sitting in my office thinking, well, let's see what happens. And and again, you can come up with whatever you want, but at the end of the day, somebody has to find it. Yeah. Right. And yeah, so I have to come up with. I have, but like you have to tell experimentalists. I think this is what's actually the university is doing. And then uh, could you please look over there and see if you can find these other Higgses or not? They haven't found them yet. Otherwise, yeah, you, you would have uh, heard about me. Heard about it, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't see any more questions at this stage. So um, I think, in fact, we had so many questions. I think sure that we need to give a very stimulating talk. Oh, thank you. Definitely enjoyed it. Well, so let's thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. I really, uh, yeah, uh, it was very stimulating. <laughs>